the site of Ape Malaysia the reforestation. You see the guy back here working on the. Hello. Yeah. And what's your name? Oh. Rafis. Rafis? Yeah. We have Rafis, one of the employees here. And now we're touring this wonderful site that Mark is the leader on. Hello. <laughs> so, uh, can you officially introduce yourself? Okay. Uh, my name is Mark Louis Benedict. Everyone just call me Mark, and I'm the project manager of Ape Malaysia. So I manage the uh, forest restoration project here in the Lower Kinabatangan uh, Wildlife Sanctuary in Sabah, Malaysia, Borneo. Perfect. All right. Well, <laughs> it's looking good. The thing that is quite good also is that you see the tree. Like just now, you were looking at the fruit tree, the bangkal tree. Uh -huh. It's already starting to fruit. Uh -huh. So a lot of the trees that we have planted in 2017. Uh, Majority of them here are already uh, flowering and fruiting and we have started to see a lot of wildlife returning back uh, Mainly primates such as like uh, macaques, proboscis monkeys also coming back here And we had uh, uh, an orangutan also, not in this particular site but further down uh, But where we are walking, this is kind of like you can see uh, all of this Last time used to just be killed with uh, non-native grasses, uh, mm. a little bit swampy uh, Non-native grasses, but if you look all around now, uh, it's all full of trees uh, yeah, oh, so yeah. all of this is part of the, the restoration site. Uh, in this particular area, we have planted like uh, more than uh, 7,000 trees uh, just on this side all the way to the back. Uh, it is very difficult to replicate a forest that has already been damaged or destroyed. This site here has no trees. It has mm -hmm. already been logged, it has already been degraded. The soil wasn't at its best. So we have to try to find ways to create a wildlife corridor. Mm. To be able to replicate back a natural forest, we also will need the help of the wildlife eventually. So what we're creating right now is just the first layer. Create the tall trees where wildlife can return back when it's starting to flower and fruit. And the trees at the same time will also drop their own progeny. Mm. Put in second layers of additional species from what we have planted in the first phase as part of the second phase and then eventually when wildlife start returning back they will also start bringing things from other parts of the forest yeah. area and hopefully by then we can start ha having a much more healthier forest in the long run by eating yeah. some of the fruits and other there's the forest and pooping it here pooping it here yeah mm -hmm. and then it will help to get back what we call as natural regeneration to happen our general understanding is that you know in a tropical rainforest everything grows well yeah. And by a matter of fact, all animals feed on something from other parts of the forest. They come over here, mm -hmm. they will drop their seeds, and the seeds are encased in a layer of poo, which is acting as a good fertilizer. They drop oh, to the ground, yeah. they will grow, you know, uh -huh. they will, they're supposed to grow. But the challenge that we face here, why this area needs to be restored by humans, yeah? why forced intervention by humans are required is because this area is full of grasses. The grasses last time was very tall. It is as tall as you and me. Wow. That was how tall it is. So the thing is that these grasses, okay, mm -hmm. every time when animals, let's say a hornbill passes by, it might just drop mid-air. It never is able to drop that seed onto soil because the grasses are so thick. Oh, wow. So it drops on the layer of the grasses and under hot sun, high temperature, humidity, everything, they just desiccate, they die. The seeds die eventually. And then also sometimes it, if the seeds do fall down or the fruits do fall down, fall down to, the, to the grass layer, maybe animals who might be traveling on the forest floor, pigs or deers or whatever, might feed on it. Mm -hmm. uh, so they are never able to drop to a soil, a proper soil, to root themselves. Mm -hmm. Hence that is why this area retains as just grasses for a very long time, susceptible towards uh, forest fires if it's very dry or drought period, and there's no trees at all. Mm -hmm. So that's why forced human intervention is required because this area used to have forests before but because of human activities and because of logging and etc it has been degraded uh, and it creates a bottleneck for a lot of wildlife uh, wildlife is unable to come in here so we have to plant these trees so what we are doing is just creating the first layer to allow subsequent wildlife to eventually use this forest this mm -hmm. little patch of forest and hopefully they will also in time help to regenerate the forest back again yeah. So like in our site, if you look at it, uh, I will say that it's not 100% uh, as natural as we would like it to be. For example, uh, in order for us to maintain the trees or to take care of it on a regular basis, we have to plant the trees in what we call as 
a line planting. Yeah, okay. Ah. You know, we did in some areas also where we do cluster planting. So that means uh, where we plant three trees in a triangular gap. Yeah, I always thought cluster yeah. planting was better, but you're saying that even though being conscious of this ultimately for maintenance and uh, and to ensure the uh, success of it, yeah. it needs to be planted in lines? In lines, yeah. For, for this particular site, we found out that line planting works best. And how do you know it? It's because we see all of our line planting trees survive uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, in quite tough conditions. So this is a site that is very open last time, just full of grasses, totally exposed to the sun. Mortality will be very high if it's not being maintained. But in order for us to ensure that the trees that we plant will be able to, to be successful in terms of height growth, we plant them in line so it's easy for the team to locate where the trees are because mm -hmm. the trees we plant they're just about you know three feet high yeah and if we are late in coming for maintenance the grasses will overgrow them uh, so what we have found out in some of our early uh, data studies of restoring uh, sites here is that uh, in one year after planting a tree you need to maintain that particular tree minimal three times in a year yeah. in every three to four months interval you need to come back again because the grasses, if you do not maintain by cutting grasses. Yeah. So that means like, for example, uh, this is a tree that we have planted as part of the second phase. Mm -hmm. uh, now the thing is, because this area is slowly restored, mm -hmm. the trees that were planted on the first phase is now starting to create a very nice canopy cover. Mm -hmm. So the intensity of sunlight is reducing. So the thing that we have noticed also is the grasses height is reducing. Ah. Ah, last time when they're too small, these grasses overgrow. Oh, yeah. uh, because they are exposed to the sun and every element, they just rip it. So part of the regular uh, maintenance of the team has to engage in is uh, cutting the grass. Yeah, so they, <laughs> we are armed with uh, machetes like this. Mm -hmm. uh, locally, we call it a parang. Mm -hmm. So we do what we call as paranging. So we will do a lot of like, you know, clearing all of this one. Yeah, using the machete to pretty much uh, expose the soil. And also at the same time, sometimes we get a lot of creepers growing yeah. on the tree oh, uh, yeah. they want to grow up to sunlight right so sometimes when they grow up here they have nowhere to go they start flowering here oh yeah uh, so when they start to flower they become heavy they start pushing the tree down oh uh, so once the tree push down then they have nowhere to go they start another root will start coming up here again so eventually they just start pulling the tree until it collapses they're like uh many secret uh, <laughs> strength <laughs> yeah well it's just the the survival of the fittest yeah. for pretty much all of this forest uh, forest floor community, the creepers yeah. and everything. Everybody wants to reach up to sunlight. So in order for us to help the tree, uh, regular maintenance is important. So what we have found out in most of our sites, uh, for most planted trees, if maintenance are done uh, regularly for at least one year, uh, the tree's survivability will increase up to about 75 to 80 wow. percent. Uh, this is what we have found out based on the early data that we have done on, on planted trees. Uh, uh, but we have also had a study plot last time where we decided to just plant and leave it just purposely and the mortality there is very high after one year only about 20 percent of those trees survive yeah that is how bad it is but out of 100 trees yeah and will it so and then and, the, and first of all yeah the grass that uh is giving the, the biggest problems the super tall grass and everything is mm. that's non-native non-native yeah a lot a lot of these are non-native non -native to this area uh, most of them are lalang, mm -hmm. so lalang are, are non-native grasses. They are, they normally grow in uh, open pastures, uh, open yeah. wide areas that have already been cleared. They tend to dominate that, those whole areas. So the thing is that once they start to become thick and they start to kind of like cover the whole place, uh, it is almost impossible for natural forest regeneration to happen. And that's the reason why we have to come in to yeah, so the the, the, na the native grasses of uh, Saba, Borneo, mm. um, you don't really have to deal with that problem. It, it's more it's more designed for regeneration. And yeah, gaps. because with our natural grasses, like mm -hmm. the ones that grows along the riverbank, uh -huh. uh, the elephant grasses, as we call them, the elephant grasses, they are elephants to help to maintain them. Ah. Ah, because you see, the elephant grasses also like the elephants have a way to work around it. Uh, this. Uh, Elephant grasses, when they grow to become very thick, okay, mm -hmm. a lot of it, uh, some parts of it is very soft. So when the elephants do their migration, mm -hmm. they will not pull it from the roots, uh, they will just feed on the shoots. So oh. whenever they pull the shoots out, they're actually creating new shoots to grow again. Oh. So they're helping to maintain it. So that's why the migration of elephants, like in the Kinabatangan, it is based on 
wherever the availability of food sources are. So they know that if they come here in March, okay, uh -huh. to feed on it, all right, in this whole patch of elephant grasses, let's say, they've already pulled all of the young shoots. Why they like the young shoots is because it's very soft, it's very sweet, it's very succulent. So they like eating on it. So the whole, let's say, a herd of them feed on it. Then they continue migrating again to another different area. Mm -hmm. Six months later, they come back again. They come back to the same place, new shoots again. Yeah. Then they feed again. Then they continue again upriver. Then they repeat the same cycle to the same patch again. Uh, so they are the ones that are helping to maintain the viability of natural grasses in the forest because they are animals that are eating on it. And yeah. elephants don't eat uh, the non-native grass. Nothing oh. eats it. Nothing eats it. In some of the sites, we have installed camera traps as well. Uh -huh. So the camera traps is uh, used to allow us to monitor a wildlife movement within the restored area. At the same time, also it helps us to see what animals, what species that we have here, and it allows us to also best manage our site in terms of you know what trees to be planted, where we should plant. And another reason of having camera traps is also to monitor for illegal activities, uh, yeah. such as like. Uh, uh, encroachment into you know forest reserves this is like a protected area or maybe poaching or whatever like that so in this particular site yeah we have seen a lot of uh, wildlife uh, coming back like i mentioned primates we've seen them last time they used to spend a lot of time very low mm -hmm. on small some of no, small trees uh, but now they tend to spend a lot of time up on the mm -hmm. big trees because it's already established so they can start jumping here and there and feeding on the fruits uh. but we have also seen a lot of ground mammals as well uh. Uh, deers and pigs, mm -hmm. uh, occasionally otters, uh, leopard cats, uh, all slowly returning back to, to areas where the forest has slowly been restored. But my biggest, uh, how to say, my biggest goal, hopefully yeah. one day, is I want to get a clouded leopard in our site. Yeah. We have never seen a clouded, in all of our sites, we have never seen a clouded leopard nice. before. Orangutan, okay, nice. yes. Orangutan, we had uh, in one of the sites that we have restored in 2012. Started restored in 2012. So, so this uh, is the tree that the orangutan had a nest right up there? Yeah. When was it, Amu? Uh, it was in the 2000, 2019. But the tree is up to like only 2 meters. Okay. Less than 2 meters high. <laughs> then yeah. I found the orangutan using the trees and this one. This is the tree that being used by the orangutan. It was, so, the tree was only 2 meters high? Yeah, 2 so, meters high. Okay, so this, this is the part that's interesting. Yeah, uh, Even for me, it was interesting uh, because the, the field team, Moose and the team uh, discovered. So this is a tree that we planted uh, 2017. 2017. Yeah. 2017. This uh, tree species is, in English, they're called the Indian Almond. But locally, we call it Talisai Paya. Uh -huh. Scientifically, it's known as uh, Terminalia copelandii. Okay. It's one of the best trees in the rainforest, does very well in swampy area. Some people like to call it the umbrella tree. The reason is because when they grow, they tend to create a very big canopy, like an umbrella. You see how they grow up like that? Eh? Oh yeah, yeah. Like oh an yeah. Umbrella, like yeah. So the thing about this tree though, eh, is that uh, when it was just about two years old plus, eh, and maybe at a height of about two to almost three meters high, we found a nest very low down. Made by orangutan, and, and that, and that, that it can support right? something like orangutan, a, a, a tree that short. Uh, yeah, we we believe we believe the team believed that uh, in this area because the trees were not that big yet, uh -huh. but they were already starting to develop. The orangutan walk on all fours. Oh. Very seldom they will do that. But yeah. in exposed area when they have no opportunity to be up on tall trees, they will just silently walk, and they reach to a tree and decided to go up on that tree and built a nest on it. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. So that, that was the very first time also for the team to find orangutan nest that is very low. Uh, but I think like now because these trees are big, hopefully he can make a nice bedding just at the top. Oh, know? yeah. Okay, now we're on solid ground. Yeah, this one is a bit drier. Okay. The site where you were walking just now uh -huh. in 2017 and as you can see from this angle how the trees have all grown like really very nice but this is not complete we need to be able to connect this restored forest to the forest at the end there. oh uh, you see the forest at the end there so the other side yeah. they need to connect to that yeah. forest. so that forest there is still pretty intact it's like this section 
to that section is maybe about one kilometer roughly yeah, yeah to get over to that point so the challenge that we are facing here last time is that uh, we are dealing with agriculture players eh, or mm. plantation players so the thing last time that was also a big problem was that you see the fences here mm -hmm. this is like palm the, oil right there. Ah, the palm oil here the remnants of this fence last time they used to put electric wire fences here oh, as wow. a boundary uh, so that's why i told you that for the, animals or people or both the reason is mainly for animals especially the elephants yeah uh, because they do not want the elephants to come into the property and cause uh, damages eh, especially to their crops and you know to the facilities that they have there yeah. but uh, we have been working with this plantation actually for quite a few years already mm -hmm. they were in the beginning a bit difficult to work with but with the help of the Sabah Wala department, which is our main collaborators, we have managed to kind of like negotiate with them yeah. in a very diplomatically uh, good solution for both parties. Yeah? That's good. Because we want to restore this forest and this is a critical bottleneck in the Kinabatangan because animals cannot cross. If you're on the river, it's also a very big so eyesore because it's suddenly palm oil. Yeah. So there's no way animals can cross from that end to reach to the other forest. And this ah. is a, it's a very big corridor. So what, what the master plan will, will look like now for this particular area is mm -hmm. restore here, already done. Now, as you can see, all of the small trees around your height that we have already restored here. We are going to be restoring all of these areas all the way to the forest at the back. So um, how, how did you... Uh... How did you negotiate? Or what, you said diplomatically, but like, what, what was the agreement? Like, what did you, uh... <laughs> yeah, we, we worked together with the Sabah Wildlife Department. And uh, actually, if, if we were to take it in uh, matters in like really very seriously, then uh, we can actually say that this is already, you know, encroachment mm -hmm. of the wildlife sanctuary and it, the forest reserve. It's always supposed to have that riparian yes. growth of the forest along the river. Yes, but uh, we do not want to take it as like how to say like really hard on like that yeah. because it will involve a lot of uh, laws and policies and it will have court issues as well and all of this will cause our team to not be able to work there yeah. because if it starts to become a police case a court case because you know things like this because of land 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 issues and whatever mm -hmm. then automatically whatever that we're doing it have to be stopped because investigation have to be done and we do not know how long that will take so in order for us to continue working we just have to find a, a, a different solution work out a different way so the first thing that we that we ask the plantation to do is to remove off the hot wires that they've installed here that has already mm -hmm. caused a bottleneck so they agreed they just realign it to the area instead of blocking this whole path number mm -hmm. one and number two uh, with the wildlife department they have also agreed for our team to work here and restore back this whole area up until it can get there and the third agreement is when the palm trees have already reached its maturity cycle whereby it's non-productive already they will then realign the fence to just cover the property but this one can be restored back again so you don't have to give them anything like uh money oh, or, no 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 not at all or no. gifts or like no 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 okay yeah that we did we didn't have to do anything you're operating within the law so you're yeah, just yeah, like look let's just work yes. we need to follow this law but let's make it work for both of us. yes yes okay. it, it's something like that yeah so it's an amicable agreement uh that where we did it like in a in a, in a diplomatic way where it's a win-win situation so, and it's good to see that this palm oil uh, owner uh, that used to be a bit difficult to work with, he's slowly opening up his heart by, you know, uh, allowing our team to work. And sometimes he comes and say hi to us as oh, well. Nice. So, like, I mean, like, he, he seems to have a bit of an open heart, but we understand that it's also a business for him. Right here is uh, on, on uh, clay soil that's kind of strangled by the grass. These trees that were planted here two years ago, barely grown at all. But... Because of the work of Mark and uh, bringing new soil to the area and uh, rock phosphate. And then uh, now we're starting to see the growth. What species do we have here of trees? Okay, so this uh, two species that we have brought here, mm -hmm. these are what we call as the red river figs. Mm -hmm. or in our local language, no, no, we call it tangkol. Mm -hmm. uh, scientifically, like, it's known as ficus racemosa. Okay. Yeah, it is uh, one of the uh, very popular trees along river rind forest of the Kinabatangan. It fruits all year round, very bright reddish fruits when it's fully ripe, eaten by a whole lot of wildlife. Nice. And uh, also when it when the fruits drop down to the river, it's also eaten by fishes as well. Oh, perfect. Mm. All right, a demonstration how to plant right, trees yeah. in the reforestation site. I'm gonna share them with you. Eight Malaysia. Now, as you can see, it's very thick clay. Yeah, 
basically we have using this one the shovels and how large is the hole that you need to be dig up is they're pretty much like this <coughs> then uh, this is how deep that you will be uh, dig up uh -huh. basically you will put it in yeah, this is the perfect hole to plan okay then <coughs> so how, how, how deep it's only like this like the, the length a little bit longer than your hand yeah okay a little bit longer than my hand then when you take it out the whole soil you have to scratch it okay break it, yeah. break it down yeah you have to break it down to the soils and what you will be do, doing next we have uh, we have a rock phosphate here we have a top soil uh-huh so what i'm gonna doing now i will put it in the top soil just put uh, two handfuls of the soil then i take a one handful of rock phosphate okay them, mix them then i take out my trees gently you see all the roots this yeah oh yeah then scramble a bit on the bottom part of, of your trees so it will be uh, much easily for the rooting to separate. Okay. Okay. <laughs> then whatever that you dig out from the soil, you have to put them back into okay. the holes and crush it then. Now the sun's coming out to feed the tree. <laughs> Up the half, then check it one more. All right. And add one more. Nice, just like that. Yeah, so if you take it out, if you take it all the soil, uh -huh. then you have to. And you put some leaf litter on the top? Yeah, using the leaf ledge. We're using uh, the leaf mulch. It's mulch? not very exposed to the sun. Uh -huh. And uh, during the early in the mornings, they will be called like a mistis. And it's a very good for the soils and for the trees. Oh, Particularly if they don't have the rains, but the leaf mulch when you're planting in the rainforest, like inside here, they have so many leaf litter fall down. Yeah, you don't need that. Ground, so it's very easily to get the leaf mulch, but inside here, because of it's just the grass, so we need to get the leaf mulch from the forest. We bring them here, then this is how we do it. Yeah. And the most importantly, uh, the poly bags. Okay, so you take it out with your baby trees. Usually, we have the sticks like this, so we put next to it, so we know that this tree is done. Oh, okay. It's already planting. But so, we're not, but we're not leaving the poly bags inside of the forest. Every time we uh, finish planting, we take it them back. Okay. Oh, okay, and nice. A temporary marker. Yeah. Like because the team when they come in to plant, sometimes they plant like three hundred to five hundred trees at one go. Yeah. So they need to know which is already done. Yeah. My name is Jay from Rainforest Eye. We're here with Priscilla, partner, camera woman. And we're, she's from Brazil, and we're here in Sabah, Malaysia, Borneo, on the island of Borneo, planting a tree with eight Malaysia. All right, let's go. <laughs> Priscilla here. I'm from California. She's from Brazil. And here we are 
planting trees, helping regrow the rainforest in Sabah, Malaysia to uh, improve uh, Sabah, Malaysia and the whole world because the world needs rainforest. All right, so I'm here with Moose. Uh, he's a local of this area and uh, he's the team leader mm -hmm. of this project over at, with Ape Malaysia in this yeah. particular site. And uh, uh, how did you, so you're originally from this village. You, yeah. You've lived here your whole life. Yeah. What's right. the name of the village? A uh, village called uh, Sukau. Sukau, yeah. okay. So he's from Sukau. And uh, how did you start working with Ape Malaysia and, and why did you want to do this work with him? All right, so uh, thank you, Jay, for your questions to uh, ask me. Well, uh, I started to uh, joining with Ape Malaysia, but before that, I, I was a naturalist uh, in house guide. Oh, yeah? Oh, you're a guide too, yeah, okay. Naturalist to a guide until in the 2017s, I get offers to work with uh, Ape Malaysia. Then I found that it's a, something I'm very interested in because I'm doing, I'm doing for wildlife, I'm observing animals, birds, monkeys. You already knew about the yeah. nature, had an appreciation yes. for all the wildlife in the forest. But there's something that I want to do about, I mean, uh, in the long term, I want to help the animals by planting the trees, by supporting them, by uh, also uh, making good forests where they can leaves. Because mm -hmm. of my places now, they are not all the areas that we have uh, pretty big for the animals. So this is what I wanted. Mm -hmm. Then I get involved in this in the 2018 august 2018 mm -hmm. uh i was uh, joining with ape malaysians up until today so almost like six to seven years that i work with ape nice and the the progress that we have uh is absolutely uh fantastic it's amazing and i love to keep continuing what we are doing now to planting the trees what is your how do you see the, uh, this area looking like in 30 years what's your vision for the the suko king of batang river area well, in 30 years, this, this is uh, something that we really want us to do because of now I'm just going halfway. Yeah. There's still a long ways to go. Yeah. So I don't want to stop in the middle. Yeah. By 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 planting these trees, but I really want to see that they will be growing after 30 years. Mm -hmm. So firstly, that we have a much places for the animals to travel. Mm -hmm. the secondly, that we all the trees that will be implanted, there will be a lot of people will get involved and take actions. Yeah. It's still not too late. The thirdly, there will be a lot of young generations will be joining yeah. to be uh, part of this. Uh -huh. Even though they were not uh, joining with the apps Malaysia, but they will be joining with different any kinds of uh, things that they will help in the environment so that is good. Mm -hmm. And the fourthly that uh, all of all of the things that we have it now will be passed down to the generations. So, so you want your kids to be involved in this? And absolutely. Yeah, that's absolutely. great. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. All right. So this is how the regular maintenance happens with the trees they planted. They have to cut back all the grass, and all this is non-native grass, so it, it's very invasive. And to ensure the health of this tree, they need to uh, cut, cut it back so it has room to grow. Okay, he's taking some of the growth that's been strangling the tree. It's starting to, now he's trimming some of the, the smaller leaves to inspire new growth. So you see all the holes here. Okay. These are where the fig wasps went in to pollinate it. So that's why all of these are red. So uh -huh. these are holes made by the fig wasps. I'm just gonna collect two of these and then you can have a look. And you all can try. Right. So when you break it open, what you'll find here is all the flowers, the gels, and plenty of seeds. Yeah. So oh, yeah. this is what I mentioned when you know you can get hundreds of seeds inside. Yeah. All 600? Of this. Yeah. yeah. All of wow. this. One. But you need to choose uh, when, whenever you collect the fruit. Not all of them are females. Uh. Mm -hmm. So you need to choose. Uh, some of them might be males. Uh, so they might not, might not flower, might not fruit, uh, or might not produce into a sapling. So you need to test them out as well. Yeah. Hmm. But basically, the part that you can eat is all this whitish part here. Yeah. So this part here, okay? This side, okay? This one, you can. Mm -hmm. mm. This side is okay. Okay. Mm. Mm. okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> don't need the inner part. Eat the outside part. Outside. Okay. Yeah, the white and red is okay. Mm. Mm. So that is what orangutans <laughs> enjoy eating. But orangutans will, will, will also eat all of this because inside here, sometimes you get a lot. Mm. If you check properly, sometimes you might find insects as well, like the fig wasps and what so. So they enjoy eating it because they can get extra protein as well besides mm. all oh, of the. Yeah. Uh, so they eat the whole thing. So uh, what do we have here? Okay, so we are currently in our egg nursery. Mm -hmm. So this is where we uh, propagate seeds mm -hmm. for saplings. Mm -hmm. And then also this is where it's our stock egg nursery, where we are working and collaborating with a lot of local family nurseries in this village to uh, buy saplings that they have uh, planted in their nursery to be stored over here. So within this particular nursery, we have uh, four different stages. Mm -hmm. The first stage that uh, we are looking at right now here, this is actually our propagation bed. Mm -hmm. So what we have in our propagation bed is a soil, uh, especially topsoil, a compost, then it's mixed together with uh, other soils that are collected around, rock phosphate and fertilizer. And this is where, whenever our team goes into the rainforest, and sometimes they find a lot of trees that are fruiting, they will collect the seeds so these are all the seeds of various type of tree species in the rainforest that have been collected. Uh, some of them are also figs. So like this one here, this is uh, Ficus uh, racemosa, mm -hmm. which is uh, one of the most important uh, fruiting trees in Kinabatangan. We call them the Red River figs. Later when we're on the boat, I'll show you some of these trees. But this is what the locals, our team collects, and then they spread the seeds around here. Once they start to propagate, uh, they will collect it out using this uh, little spoon over here. Uh, so that means they will dig it out slowly, mm -hmm. making sure that the roots are all intact. And then we will slowly move them over to the poly bags. So this is the second stage. So inside here are the poly bags where all of the trees that have been propagated by seeds will be kept in. Mm -hmm. And over here we will uh, take care and maintain of it until they reach a good height. So the ones that you see here, these are all part of the second floor. These are all planted from seeds. Mm -hmm. They are still growing, but we have not moved them out into the stockade area. Mm -hmm. uh, those at the stockade area, as you can see, they are of uh, multiple species. Uh, these are species that comes from our uh, germination bed and through our uh, uh, yeah, sapling movement area here. Part 2 and part 3 here is where we also uh, collect uh, saplings from other nurseries. That is why if you look at most of the trees along this area, they are quite tall. They mm -hmm. are about 3 to 4 feet high. And most of the trees here are already ready to be mm -hmm. transferred over by boat to our reforestation site. Okay. So in our planting, uh, in our nursery, we have currently about uh, 28 uh, different tree species. So all of these tree species, they are native to the forest of the Kinabatangan. All of them are flowering and also fruit-bearing trees, which are very important for a lot of the wildlife in the Kinabatangan. And uh, some of these trees are also trees that are suitable to be planted in floodplain and waterlogging area, mainly because uh, in most parts of the Kinabatangan also, we are dealing with uh, some places where it's constantly uh, waterlogged or inundated by water. So we need to be able to choose three species that mm -hmm. will be able to survive in this kind of environment. Is that like a peat swamp? Uh, yeah, something similar to like a swamp, a peat swamp forest mm -hmm. where the uh, soil acidity is actually quite high. Mm -hmm. It's constantly waterlogged. Uh, sometimes whenever it rains very heavily or during the monsoon time when the river rises, it brings water from other areas and it just yeah, mm. floods that whole place. So in places like this which are degraded, we will have to look into three species that will be able to survive in those kind of environment and will be able to grow well as well. Mm. But the technique of planting will be a bit different over there depending on the situation that we face. Uh. But if you walk inside this nursery here, uh, it's a bit muddy, sorry for that. But, it, uh, but if you walk a bit uh, in, yeah, you can just walk in. <laughs> oh, you lost your foot. It's <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, it's a bit muddy. Hi. <laughs> That's why you have to have your shoes and mud and boots on. Okay, yeah. So, like uh, over here, you can see that uh, we have uh, a couple of uh, species of uh, trees uh, that we have named them. Yeah. So uh, there are small blocks around here, and you can see just from the leaf structures uh, that. Uh, yeah, there are multiple is, different species. Uh, is that the common species. name in uh, Yeah, this Malay? is like the local name. And uh, this is the genus uh, and the, yeah, the scientific name. 
Some of them might not 100% be listed. Uh, we just break, break them down into blocks uh, depending on species so that mm -hmm. we know uh, whenever we need it, we, mm -hmm. can, uh, we can find it. Yeah, but uh, over here currently, we have about uh, 20 over species uh, including those in, uh, in the germination bed, mm -hmm. the nursery potting area. So this is kind of like the holding area. And then the last stage is just outside. So the last stage... <laughs> yeah. So this area here, mm -hmm. this is kind of like our uh, hardening area. Okay. So what do we mean by hardening area is that normally before the trees are being brought out to the field mm -hmm. for planting, we will be uh, leaving them outside just like this, uh, normally for a period of uh, two weeks minimum. Uh, okay. We bring them out onto the site. And the reason of uh, doing hardening uh, is mainly to ensure that the trees uh, they adapt to living in what we call as a stress environment when they go into the forest. Uh -huh. So that means if they are living in this kind of environment, this is like you won't get you won't be able to replicate the kind of temperatures inside here. Yeah. And constantly being watered most of the time. So over here, the watering also we reduce just once a day. Inside here, they do it normally two to three times in a day. Oh, okay. So quite constant because yeah. they're still being taken care of. But once we know that we need certain trees to go out into the field for planting, then we start putting them outside here and we leave them to be hardened. So we will leave them to be hardened and normally just a few days before the planting. Mm -hmm. So about three to five days like that, uh, anywhere between that period, our team will start to do what we call as pruning. Mm -hmm. So you start to see here, the leaves have actually been chopped half. Okay, so the reason of uh, pretty much uh, doing pruning in uh, most of the small trees uh, is uh, first of all, what we are trying to do okay, is to encourage the trees uh, to start uh, shooting up new shoots, uh -huh. uh, which is very important. So once we start to see new shoots shooting up, we also know that they will start producing more roots as well. Ah, uh, because yeah. a, lo a lot of these trees, uh, they have been kept in the poly bag for a very long time. Like the process flow from seeds to being transferred to the uh, poly bags here and here it takes at least a minimum about six to eight months before they are ready to go out on the field oh okay uh, so like most of the trees that you see here like this one here that we have put out uh, most of these are already more than six months so they are already waiting to go out into the forest but they have been pampered yeah for the first six months so we need them now to adjust to the stress that they will face when they go into the forest so before they go out, the last stage is the pruning part to encourage and to promote uh, new uh, shoots and leaf developments at the top and also to promote uh, roof growing. And then after that, our team will start taking this out on a wheelbarrow into the boat. Mm -hmm. And then from the boat, we will start uh, transporting them out uh, into our site. Nice. Uh, why why we uh, create it in like a small, like, you know, it looks like, like a small nursery as well is because we want it to be scalable for the community. Yeah. So that means uh, we have a process flow that a lot of local nurseries here doesn't have. Uh, oh. So like for example, from the germination bed up to the uh, uh, planting area for seeds and then the stockade area, the hardening and the pruning. This system flow is not seen in local nurseries. Oh really? Most of the local nurseries here, they either rely on two things. Uh, one is either seeds, which they do, but sometimes most of them, they prefer to go the faster route that is through wild link collection. Uh, so that means when a tree fruits, it drops down their seeds to the ground, the seeds germinate on their own in the forest, and when they reach a certain size, they get collected. But the thing is that uh, what we are trying to achieve here and also try to educate the local community is that for us, we believe that too much wildling collection is actually not good. Yeah. Because in the rainforest, trees are already propagating their own babies. Uh, we are not... Uh, it's not good to continuously collect and collect it until there's nothing on the forest floor. Yeah, yeah. You know? So it's much better to be able to collect them from seeds because what we have found out through seed germination eh, is that one tree, like for example, the figs eh, that we are propagating now, mm -hmm. the figs, especially the ficus racemosa, one fruit can have up to 500 to 600 seeds. So if, let's say, let's say, eh, you can have 70% survivability out of that, you get 300. Yeah. 400 uh, trees. It's 70% can... survivability? Yeah. Is that high? Yeah, that, that's already considered high because there will be some that, that will either die 
uh, there might be fungal infection, mm -hmm. the germination bad, they might die because of desiccation, sometimes care as well. So your aim yeah. is for the 30% to use those seeds to uh, propagate new areas of the forest? Yeah, so that means like uh, what, what we're trying to suggest to local communities is that it's much better to plant them by seeds because you get more quantity and then secondly also seed planting till they become a tree is much more hardier, much yes. more stronger compared to collecting them out when they're already rooted on the ground. Oh, really? Uh, and then, yeah. And then also at the same time, uh, when they're already rooted on the ground, uh, sometimes they're already growing. And then when you take them out, it's a high stress level also for the trees to come into a nursery, to be planted in a bag and to go out. Because what, what we see in some of the local nurseries is that sometimes we understand as well uh, the complexity of it. Uh, most of the local nurseries, they look at saplings as a source of income. So mm -hmm. the faster the trees go out, the better. Uh, but for us, it's the quality of saplings that will ensure Definitely. the successfulness of our restoration project. So what we're trying to do over here is that with our staff, we create a model nursery. So our model nursery will have the system flow where mm -hmm. we hope to be able to educate the local communities in this area that are also supplying us with trees that it's scalable, it's achievable. Uh, you don't need to have ex expensive gears, expensive tools or high-tech equipment to create a nursery yeah. that has a system flow. Mm -hmm. uh, we need the system flow to ensure that all of the saplings that are being produced in the Kinabatangan for any forest restoration project, so regardless whether it, we, buy it from, we buy it from them or we use it, or it can also be like, a, for example, they sell it to other re reforestation projects, we need to ensure that all of the saplings that comes out from here, from any local nurseries, are of good quality, of good standard. That's because great. What's important is that when they go into the forest, they need to survive. Okay. Because we have found out that uh, uh, some of the saplings that we have bought, brought before from local nurseries do have a lot of issues as well. So oh, really? Our team is very meticulous now. Eh? Whenever we buy saplings, we need to ensure that you know the trees are already rooted inside the poly bags. You know, because sometimes if, if let's say you take a wildling in the forest, you collect yeah. it and then you put it in a poly bag. If you leave it just for one week, the roots are not yet rooted. By the time you hold them like this, they will just fall off. Yeah. So you know that they are not rooted yet. They have just been taken out. So uh, if like that, we have to reject them. We have to tell the nurseries, I'm sorry, we can't take it. We have to reject. So uh, we have to deal a lot with the local communities, but it is also part of the education process that we are trying to do. So like with our team, we have two nurseries just like this that we have already created a system flow. Mm -hmm. And uh, every time whenever we have uh, other nurseries coming over, we can teach them and we can train them. So it's something that we also want to do in the long run to uh, upskill the local community in terms of, you know, uh, how to plant trees from seeds, uh, create a system flow in the nursery and having hardening base, doing pruning and everything like that so that the sapling quality and content will be good. Okay, so this is the one of the official uh, ape nurseries, and you say there's one more, but you also purchased uh, trees from the community. So how many uh, nurseries in total do you work with, including uh, the two here? Okay, so when we first started our project 10 years ago, we only had about 15 mm -hmm. uh, local nurseries, local village nurseries that are working with us. But currently, right now, we have 64 altogether. Oh, wow. 64 families uh, having nurseries and propagating uh, trees as well. And then we buy it from them for the usage of our tree planting project. Nice, that's yeah. a great way to uh, include the community. And yes. yeah, I like that approach better than one just giant nursery, mm. you know, and this is more of a scalable model that they could actually yes. reproduce. Yes, so indeed. this yeah. is a very good uh, idea. Yeah, yeah. G great work. <laughs> So if you search for Ape Malaysia on Restore, restore.eco, you can see all of our sites where it's located. So we put it on an open public source. Everybody can see. Nice. Nothing That's... to hide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what many people may not know is mm. that uh, not only are you a conservationist and, you know, an expert in uh, land management and uh, reforestation, but he's also a guide and a photographer. And he's actually won awards for his photography. Oh yeah. <laughs> so how long were you a guide? Uh, um, yeah, so I started uh, guiding I think back in 2003. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time I just completed like uh, tourism studies and then uh, I worked in a, for a tour company who owns an eco lodge mm -hmm. and I was uh, based there for a few years and it was at the time that uh, I also started to uh, get into contact with a lot of, you know, um, 
like bird watchers, uh, ornithologists, so once and a birder, also always those a birder. that are interested right? in photography. And I think <laughs> along the way, uh, it also motivated me and made me interested to, you know, pick up something new. So it started like uh, just being a normal tour guide. Normal tour guide, like general, like general, the yeah. forest, and yes. the Saba. Yeah, something like that. So it started with me being a general tour guide. but For beginner people. Yes, for beginners. And then eventually, as I started to no. get exposed to more uh, special interest group, I also started to uh, slowly upgrade my knowledge. And, you know, I was also motivated to start uh, doing bird watching. When did you get into photography? Around the same time or a little bit later? Or? A little bit later. I'll say, like, I started, uh, actually, photography... Uh, when I was still young, I used to do a lot of photography as well because my dad was very much into uh, photography. Mm -hmm. He's a, he likes hiking and stuff and me being the only son, uh, he always used to bring me out. My late dad used to bring me out for camping and hiking trips, less my sisters. I don't know why, maybe I'm a boy, but we used to always go out together and he also enjoys taking uh, photos as well. So I remembered he was using a very old uh, Konica, mm -hmm. Konica Minolta uh, film camera oh, at the wow. time. So it was from there and I remember when I was a bit older, I think about 13 or 14 like that, my, my dad gave me my, a first film camera as well to just, you know, play around. But I didn't take anything seriously at that time, it was more just enjoying, you know, just snapping around. I didn't learn too much of the intricacies of, you know, uh, photography. Mm -hmm. It was a little bit later when I, I was traveling more around, more opportunities to encounter wildlife and such that I also started to become interested in photography, so I took up my first uh, DSLR, mm. uh, and I yeah I'm actually a loyal Nikon user. I've yeah. been using Nikon for a very long time. So, so what do you like about photography as far as uh, how it connects you to the the nature around you or yeah, just I, the action of it? Mm, I mean, like uh, for me, photography is is the best medium to share to a lot of people uh, you know that have never been to Sabah or never been to Borneo people all around the world about the wonders that we have in our rainforest because I spend a lot of time in the, in the rainforest and sometimes I get those moments you know the moments where I see you know maybe a clouded leopard climbing up on the tree during the daytime when they're active during the night or there was one moment here in the Kinabatangan that I managed to document as well of uh, an orangutan with two babies, twins, oh, wow. which is not always recorded in the wild. Maybe rare bird species or, you know, those rare moments, rare rare sightings of wildlife or the, the species itself. So having a camera is an important tool in the rainforest because it helps you to document that species the best if you can get a good photo of it. And it's not only useful in terms of, you know, sharing it to... I know the people mm -hmm. all around the world, but it's also very important to document it as well, mm -hmm. especially nowadays in the rise of you know citizen science. You know, we can also use use it. Uh, uh, naturalists, just yeah, naturalists in high naturalists, you know, e-birds or things like that. You can help mm -hmm. to document a lot of things as well. And I think there's still a lot of things in in our forests in Sabah, in general in Borneo that perhaps is yet to be discovered. So nice. the more people that is out there doing photography there's more opportunities for more things to be documented and recorded as well. Oh yeah, that's a good way to put it, for sure. Mm. So, how, what was your transition from being a guide uh, photography, and you still take partake in photography, he still goes on trips and he does, he, he, he takes really good photos, you should check him out, Mark Lewis Benedict. But um, what, what made you switch to uh, conservation, yeah, is what you're doing now? Yeah, so like uh, when I was doing a lot of uh, tourism related work, so, guiding, uh, bird watching, photography, but like uh, for tourism photography and stuff like that. Uh, I felt that uh, there was something missing, you know. I yeah. don't know why, it's just like, I felt that there's something missing. I, I wanted to do more than just, uh, you know, going out on trips like that. You know, even though it's fun, mm -hmm. I get to meet a lot of people and get to share my knowledge and my experience and to bring them on trips around Sabah, which is fun. And it's very rewarding in a sense as well. But I felt that I wanted, I always felt that there's something missing that I wanted to be able to also contribute back. Physically give back. Yeah, phys forest. yes, physically give back to be, uh, you know, doing some action to, to give back to, to nature. So like this place, the Kinabatangan, has always hold a very special place in my heart because when I first started my guiding, my guiding days, I actually first started guiding here in Kinabatangan. Okay. And I also... 
uh, got to see how this place changed as well. So it was, I started guiding here before this area was turned into a protected area. Mm -hmm. So at the time I managed to also see, you know, the uh, unfortunate part of the Kinabatangan where logging was still quite rampant mm -hmm. at the time before this area was protected as a wildlife sanctuary. And uh, I wanted to be able to give back. So when the opportunity came with Ape Malaysia, where they uh, con contacted or connected with me to set up their volunteering program, which mm. was uh, revolving around reforestation. So it, it didn't run too far from tourism as well, except that the tourism is more towards volunteers, so educating them, but also being able to do more physical work or hands-on work uh, in conservation through forest restoration mm. work. I took that as like uh, an opportunity, slightly a different challenge that I wanted to take up. And somehow or rather, uh, it started with that first through volunteer tourism. And then eventually, we started to expand our reforestation team to have people on the ground, more local community involvement and things like that. And it just expanded across the years. And from my role of uh, running projects based on volunteers, mm -hmm. now I'm managing our local team, managing planning, meeting more. Like, you know, I, sl I slowly start to evolve to also uh, be part of the stakeholders involved in conservation in Kinabatangan. So more working with people as well from diverse backgrounds. So with the wildlife department, which is our collaborators, with universities, with other researchers, scientists, with the local community. So it, it, it expanded my role to become a bit more bigger. So I think it's, in a way, it's much more rewarding, fulfilling, and it allows me to also use my experience in tourism in other different fields as well, mm -hmm. something like that, yeah. Okay, Mark Lewis Benedict, <laughs> project leader for Ape Malaysia, conservationist, naturalist, photographer, guide, everything, <laughs> this guy right here, check him out.